welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Andrew. Today we're going to start the first of several episodes where we talk about insignia during the Civil War. This first one we'll talk about U.S. officer insignia, but down the road look for episodes that talk about Confederate insignia, enlisted insignia, and naval insignia. You might be wondering why we're talking about insignia. You know, for a lot of living historians, reenactors out there, this is stuff you think you know already. And you probably do. But for a lot of people, they don't know all of the ins and outs of it. We're going to reference the U.S. Army regulations today because we want to actually look at the source material for this. And it's important that as historians or living historians, we have a good grounding of what this should look like out there. As we know, the Civil War is a period of transition in U.S. history. We're, we're leaving the era of the Napoleonic Wars, the bright gaudy uniforms, bright colors, and we're going towards the khaki and the field gray of World War I. And the civil, there's so much change in weapons and technology, it should be no surprise that there's a change in insignia as well. Prior to the Civil War, you, start, you still had these bright epaulets and sashes and pelisses and things like that. But towards in the 1820s, the U.S. Army began to standardize insignia into a set that we would understand today. Beginning in the 1820s, they introduced epaulets for officers, boards that sit on your shoulders that are fringed with bullion of some kind. Uh, infantry officers originally had silver, and officers of the other branches, artillery, engineers, cavalry, had gold. Beginning in the 1830s, the Army introduced shoulder straps as a supplement to this for underdress uniforms. These originally were smaller and, again, kept the same colors, silver for infantry, gold for the other branches, and they were in use on combat uniforms, underdress uniforms, up through the end of the Mexican War. Beginning in the 1850s, the Army changed its insignia once again, and this is the insignia that carries through into the Civil War era. All epaulets were standardized to be gold, as were all shoulder boards. The branch colors changed a little bit at this point and became the standard ones that are in use in the Army today. And at that point, also, uh, the uh, size changed a little bit. Epaulets during the Civil War are something that are almost never seen, never worn in the field. Shoulder straps, or as we'll talk about later, subdued insignia, were almost universally worn by soldiers or by officers during the war. Uh, the shoulder strap in use during the Civil War is one inch and a, one and three eighths inches by four inches long, and it's bordered by a quarter inch of gold braid. The insignia in it is goes from a plain strap with nothing in it, which is a second lieutenant, a single gold bar, which is a first lieutenant, two gold bars of a captain, a gold oak leaf cluster of a major, a silver oak leaf cluster of a lieutenant colonel, silver eagle of a colonel or one, two, or three silver stars of a brigadier, major, or lieutenant general, respectively. This rank insignia is still the same kind of rank insignia in use today, with the exception that right before World War I, we added a bar for second lieutenants and changed first lieutenant's color to silver. But otherwise, this insignia scheme is the same one we use today. As we talked about earlier, there was that the cloth backing on these was dependent upon what you did in the Army. So general officers or staff corps officers had a dark blue backing. Infantry officers would have had a sky blue backing. Artillery officers would have had red, cavalry officers yellow. And remembering that the Civil War, we, we still had some other types of uh, units out there. At the beginning of the war, you would have seen orange backing for dragoon officers or even green backing for the regiment of mounted riflemen, or it's seen with examples in Burdan's sharpshooters and other sharpshooter units. Additionally, officers were to wear a welt on the outside of their trouser seam that also matched their branch color. Staff officers or general officers with their dark blue uh, backing, would, that wouldn't have stood out on the dark blue trousers of the 61 regulations, so they were supposed to wear a gold welt down the outside. Officers also wore sashes under their sword belts, which was a long piece of silk they wore around. It was tied on the left side, and the sword belt was worn over it. General officers wore buff sash. Medical officers wore green sash. Every other kind of officer, infantry, artillery, engineer, judge advocate, commissary, ordnance, all wore a crimson or claret colored sash. U.S. officers could also be identified based on their buttons. There was distinctive groupings based on what rank level you were at. Junior officers wore nine button single breasted frock coat that had evenly spaced out, very similar to the US enlisted coat. 
Field grade officers, majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels wore a double-breasted version that had seven rows of buttons evenly spaced out over the coat. Brigadier generals had a double-breasted coat with eight rows of buttons put in groups of two, and major generals had a double-breasted coat with nine rows of buttons in groupings of three going down the chest. Finally, there was the cloak coat, the U.S. Army officer overcoat. It's a dark blue coat. It's seen often in pictures during the war. And one of the cool things about it is that you can tell by the sleeve braid what the rank of the officers are. Depending, it could go from one grouping of sleeve braid for a lieutenant, two for a captain. It goes up from there. But again, it's a very easy way for an officer to be seen, to know someone's rank, and to not explicitly have rank insignia on the coat. But it's rather subdued with black lacing on a dark blue coat. You actually have to be fairly close to see someone. Now, as officers switch to wearing enlisted coats and things like that, you start to see that some of them did have some sort of sleeve circlet or small insignia to wear on the outside of the coat to indicate their rank on there. As we talked about at the beginning, though, officer insignia is in this transitory period during the war. We've gone away from, already they went away from using epaulets and they're using shoulder straps. As the war continued, even those bits of guilt on the shoulder made officers a target. And there's a, rec and there's a recognition early in the war that this, there needs to be something else. Starting in the summer of 1863, General Rosecrans, the commander of the Army of the Cumberland, instituted General Order 174 in July that let his officers wear subdued rank insignia, whether on the shoulder or on the collar, in an effort in order to make them less visible in targets on the battlefield. Uh, this was similarly happened in the Army of the Potomac and other major armies to the point that the actual U.S. Army wide General Order 286 in November 1864 institutionalized it across the entire army for the rest of the war. And this is a really big admission by the army that they recognized that war is becoming more modern, weapons are becoming more accurate, officers are being targeted, and the men know who their officers are. They don't need to advertise it like they're in the 1750s. And it's a really big step towards the kind of rank insignia that we see going into World War I, World War II going forward, and showing how the Civil War was really the beginning of this modern warfare. So this has been our quick survey of US officer insignia and uniforms during the Civil War. Trying to give just a basic understanding of people of what you should look like if you're a reenactor, or if you're a historian looking at pictures, what you should be looking for, and to give you clues to better understand the history of the Civil War. Hopefully it gives you just a little bit more nuance, it gives you a little better understanding. And again, look for more episodes in this on these topics as we go forward. Keep watching with us, and for Civil War Digital Digest, I'm Andy, it's been a pleasure, we'll catch you next time.